Christina, Dr. Christina yes. Ford <laughs> is a board-certified, Harvard-trained psychiatrist who incorporates traditional and interactive techniques to help her patients realize their fullest potential. She combines a background in psychodynamics, I think I'm getting that pretty close, <laughs> pharmacology and women's health, nuance with the understanding of nutrition, herbal treatments, and mind-body techniques that help maintain a healthy lifestyle. She's holistic in her approach, and she loves empowering women to be even more than they are today, which is sort of what we're all about. She's conservative in her approach to medicine, something we appreciate here, and she puts an emphasis on all the natural modes of healing. But one of the things I, we're gonna talk about tonight is I had the pleasure of being on a panel with her several months ago to talk about what's going on today with our brain. Our brain that is so overtaxed and stressed with the digital technology that surrounds us today. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that today and ask her some questions that I found sort of interesting about what's going on in 217. And we're gonna sort of start with your business a bit, just a few business questions. I wanna understand a bit, now we're on this, right? <laughs> How do you incorporate traditional interactive techniques with to, how do you incorporate traditional and interactive techniques to help patients realize their potential? So what's the difference between interactive and traditional? Um, well, so what I practice is um, integrative psychiatry, which is a burgeoning um, arm of psychiatry that really seeks to take the best of Western medicine and our traditional psychiatric knowledge and combine that with what we have come to think of as Eastern traditions or alternative treatments um, and really blend with the science that we're seeing of yoga and mindfulness and all of that and bring that in a way to make a holistic treatment plan. Interesting. Well, is it possible with our guest tonight that you could walk, this is going to be an interesting question for you, could you walk through some mind-body techniques that guide people to self-empowerment? Is it possible to share a technique with us? Sure. So, um, well, I mean, one thing we could do is we could move, but I think that's <laughs> sort of that one beyond you. Let's yes. say we're driving in our car and we're sort of stressed. Yes. Is there a technique for that hour or so that we have sitting in a car that we could use to sure. not obviously going to sleep? Certainly a, a lot of what I focus on is breath work. And I think that a lot of your, your practitioners here do the same because it is such a robust way to, to, get, at, um, to get at anxiety, to get at the mind. and. Um, so simple techniques that we can do, I don't recommend them while driving because <laughs> sometimes people, when they do some breathing, do get a little lightheaded. So I recommend that you pull over, you take that moment. So I really like to build in a mindful moment. So whether it's two, three, five, if you have 10 minutes, that's lovely. But if you're feeling that kind of burning and churning, you're in the traffic, you, can, you, can, you had a phone call, you can tell you're just being really irritable with whomever, pull over, take a moment, Get both feet on the ground, ground yourself. I'm a big fan of hand on heart or hand on belly, just so you can have that sensation of touch, which we believe um, helps you release some oxytocin, which is both calming and opens you up for more bonding and a, and a warmer experience. Um, and take that moment. You can do it with eyes closed, if that's easier for you, or eyes open with a soft focus and Find, find the points around you. Simple things like looking at red car, green tree, all these, you know, nice. whatever you see around you brings you into the, into the moment, brings you present. And from that place to then go on is usually a quieter, less reactive place. So I think that's really beautiful. How many times do you do that in your week? In a good week? <laughs> <laughs> like we were um, well, we're coming off a total two week hiatus yeah, <laughs> Just a nice insular time with yeah, my family where we kind of did nothing. Right. Um, I would say so. So because I sit a lot for my work, I actually I, I try to build a lot of this in during the day. So I make sure that I get up at least every hour. So after each patient, I get up. I try to go to the bathroom. That's the furthest away. If I'm in there alone, then, then I can stand at the sink and kind of do that there. Otherwise, I will do it in my office especially if I've had an interaction with someone or a pharmacy or something that has gotten my, my cockles going, nice. then... We need to do more of that. Yeah, I think so. Because people's blood pressure and people's stress is so high. How do we teach people to not be afraid to pause and stop and take care of themselves? I think we have to, we have to model it. Um, 
I, I try to do that with my kid. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not as easy with a four-year-old whose no, attention is everywhere. Yeah. Um, but we do, it. thankfully, he's super interested in yoga and mindfulness. Good. We've gotten some good books that really make it enticing. Um, but I think that, you know, I think we're not always aware of what we're modeling anyway. So the reason that I think what kids are so fascinated with devices is not just because they're meant to be, they're shiny and they move quickly and all of that, but we're on them all the time. So if we are taking mm, yes. those breaks, if we're putting them away in our right, amazing in our new little bags, bags <laughs> yes, and, um, and taking the time and, and doing it in a way that's respectful not only of your need, but also that it helps serve the rest of the group as well, that to take that little moment. You know, at the Golden Door, we, we have a farm-to-table practice. We literally pick our food in the morning, and it's on your plate in the afternoon, which is very unique dining. What's happening in 2017 in your practice in talking about nutrition and health for women? Mm. Um, well, nutrition is, a, is something that I'm really invested and passionate in and, and try to just keep advancing my learning in. Um, I think... There are a couple of things that we are focusing on more uh, assertively, I think, as, as the science comes in. Um, certainly, we know that omegas have been quite helpful, um, and we, we know more and more why they are so helpful. And certainly, as, as adjunct, adjunctive treatments for, for mood and anxiety issues, also for some cognitive issues, we're finding that they have really robust results. Um, so that's not necessarily new, but I think that the way that we use them is a little bit different. Um, we're looking also more at how the food we eat really can have effects on cognition, mood, anxiety, irritability, attention, all of that. And so, There's some conversation about fermenting food. Yeah. What is that? It's giving you a better, quote, gut, as they say. Right. And it's cleaning out the gut faster and allowing you to process faster. Is so, that a true? Well, so, so what's, what, tell us the story of that. Well, I'm not a gastroenterologist, so right. I wouldn't be able to go into all of the all of the um, the biology part, all of the belly yeah, yeah. belly working. But I think one of the major advances that has come up in the past mm, few months to year, um, and what we'll continue to see more attention paid to, is the microbiome. Is yeah. this whole yeah. gut brain connection? I think. You know, as we saw with um, the discovery of sorts of the mesentery, which was there anyway, but now calling it an organ is, is very interesting. interesting. Yeah. yeah, but we're seeing a focus on the connective aspects of the body. So the microbiome we know communicates with the brain and the brain with it. With, um, with connective tissues, we know that there's this whole interplay going on. And I feel like medicine is kind of moving more towards focusing on those parts. So we were very organ specific for a while, and now we're looking yeah, more at the connections. I think, it's very, I think that is definitely something in 2017 we're gonna talk a lot more about. I think so. Um, but for the fermented foods, uh, the idea is that you are, you are increasing or adding to um, positive bacteria within right, the microbiome. Right, and right. so it's the same idea as with probiotics right, right, or kombucha. Right, more now, yeah. yeah, things like that. So I'm gonna switch gears a bit to go where I really wanna talk. Last year, Arian Heffington was here and we interviewed her about her sleep revolution book. And you know the question I'm gonna ask here, the question we all know, <laughs> we're not getting enough sleep. What a lot are, of us are we're not, We're not yes. getting enough sleep. Yeah. So our, you know, we can say this, we can all say it because it's something that's happening to all of us. So how are we gonna solve that? Because that's a major health issue. Yeah. A serious health issue, actually. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, a couple of things come to mind. The first is that I think, again, it comes to that thing of modeling. So one of the reasons that I think Ariana Huffington has made such waves and, and um, such a frame shift in the way that we're looking at issues of sleep is because here she is in this very high level, executive, you know, super powerhouse of a woman saying, we need to pull back that we're risking burnout, yeah. that this go, go, go sort yeah. of life is actually not that fulfilling in the long run, and it's coming with great costs to our livelihood in a lot of different ways, in, in frankly, in our cognition, in our it, moods. Right, in the, it, in the mind. Yes, and in, in the relationships that we have with right. other people. So again, I think it's going to take a shift in, in, how, in what we prioritize. Um, but also, just more realistically, I think we can all 
once we decide that it's something we want to work on, I think that we can all make small and really practical steps to make it a reality. Well, it just seems like the generation that we're in, the big quote, the baby boomer generation, we're not the best model for separation of work and play. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that we're going to get a lot of credibility for making that statement. So the new generation is coming up who has a deep understanding of the separation of work and play, but they are bogged down with digital mm -hmm. technology. Mm -hmm. So and even though they it. have the understanding, I am going to not sacrifice work for play, they are trapped in a digital world, which is where there's definitely benefits in solitude of turning off technology, but they're not, they don't know this yet. Right. And <laughs> they have no idea. They right. can't separate. Right. How, how will we as the models be able to teach them? I don't know that I, that I can say I have it all figured out. Um, I th because I think it's a process. I think um, you know some of it comes with with agent experience. I think because when you can go 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 go, it's not until you maybe peter out for whatever reason you get sick or something happens in your family or you're forced to stop that you realize oh there's a choice here because when all your peers are doing the same thing you know they're sending texts and emails at two thirty yeah, five thirty Snapchat you know <laughs> work yeah, com right. communicates with you at eight. 30 right, p.m. and that's right, considered to be right. normal and you know just know. part of the the day to day. I think it's going to be a, a process. Yeah. Um, but I do, I do think that that generation is also really focused on quality of life mm -hmm, totally. and on wellness, yeah. and they're really bringing that to the yeah, forefront in a certain absolutely. way. So I feel like it's gonna. I think it's coming. Yeah. I feel like it'll really happen. You know, we talk about this way that there are so many facts that there's the, the conversation, which is something we talk about a lot, that the mind today, the English language in the mind today is 15 times bigger than the days of William Shakespeare. The number of words we have that we use are 15 times. I also want you to imagine for just a moment that in the days of the pilgrims, because you heard me speak about, I mean, you've heard me speak, in one year, we hear in one day what they heard in a year. So think about what life was like then one day. Also, our audio is mm -hmm. accepting massive amounts of data all the time. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that it's going inside of ourselves. It may just be the kind of audio that just flashes, I mean, mil mil millions of pictures and sounds and minds and TV and radios and phones and conversations are now flashing before our face at all times and it's hitting audio. It might not hit here, but it is hitting the mind. Mm -hmm. Are we losing ourselves in all of this data? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think How, so. I mean, I think so. Obviously, we, live, we can't change it because this is the way the universe is going. It's going to probably be faster. We live in really um, reactive times, and in times I think where the the risk of feeling inundated is really high. Really high. And and that makes us, I think, more reactive. Um, and more anxious and stressed. Absolutely, absolutely. And just like you say, you may not necessarily be consciously hearing it all, but that doesn't mean that your brain isn't processing the noise right. or reacting to the noise. Um, and doing something with it. Absolutely. Even Absol if it's just right. shutting some part down to right. try to focus on something else. Right. You don't even realize it. Yeah. And it is, it's exhausting, right. you think. I think... Um, you, the science is telling us that it really, it, um, it leaves us really raw, kind of emotionally raw. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's something that, that we really do have to pay attention to, you know, and that's why, you know, obviously that's why a place like this is so mm -hmm. fantastic. And also why we have to think of ways that we can build aspects of this into our daily life. You know, and that brings me to a question later, I'm going to bring it now. We have this rule here about technology. I mean, we have a lot of technology, and you can watch, you know, Marilyn and Diamonds in the room in seconds. But we don't have technology in our dining room. Mm -hmm. and, you, and we don't have technology that's interfacing you throughout the day. And we encourage people to not have it so you can actually learn to separate and not be stressed and understand it's going to wait for you when you get back. But what about when we go to those restaurants? And we see the, aren't you just shocked? You see these people in the restaurants. They haven't even looked up from each other. <laughs> and they're both in the twilight zone of their phones. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they haven't even spoken to each other. So do, is, there, is there a way, do you think the society will get to the point that restaurants might start to say, you know, I'd love for you to enjoy my meal. I'd love to make new rules of social etiquette that please don't be on the phone yelling at something while I'm sitting next yeah. to you having my dinner because I really... I want to enjoy my food. I want to appreciate the meal. Absolutely, to be able to have mindful eating. Exactly. To be able to, to, be, to that, pause. That's part of it. And you, you, you know, it does get back to that question of how do you build this in? You know, 
mindfulness, yes, there is a, a practice called mindfulness meditation, and, and I'm a very big fan of it. I think it's wonderful. And there are ways to bring mindfulness into our day to day. So right, so to be able to really sit and enjoy all the tastes and smells and, and um, of the meal and colors of the meal, the, to really be able to hear the exactly. conversation with the person next to you. And to look really into their present. face. Right, right. Um, I think getting back to that thing about the digital, it keeps us away from being present. And that's what mindfulness is about. It's about really just being present in the moment. And, and so it, it is something that I think that, again, that we have to really try to pay attention to and that we can practice because yeah. when you're present, things don't necessarily bother you as much. They roll off a little bit right. better. It, and when you can carry that state throughout the day and from day to day and week to week, month to month, your relationships with people are better. Because it, it almost feels like when you're in that piece of technology, you're with the person that's not even with you. And the person if who's that. with you, <laughs> isn't the person you're talking to. And so therefore you're lonely. Yeah. And that's not it can be. Can a, really that's isolating. not a good that's not good for your soul and all that stuff that goes with it. There really is something about So it seems like it'd be, be an interesting petition, right? To get restaurants <laughs> to say, I'm sorry, you cannot smoke, you cannot do you know, your iPhones while I'm serving you a, din a dinner. <laughs> do you think that men and women use technology or social technology differently? Is your mm. is, do you think there's a difference in how they use it? I don't know. I, I feel like everyone uses it a lot. You think that they're equally lot. as stressed? <laughs> you think they, they get equally as stressed as women? Probably. Probably. Probably, you might yeah. not see it as much. Yeah, I don't know if it's a gendered issue because I think that um, the, the phones are there, the iPads are there, the dings, the, the pings, the living in a busy city. You've also got city noise that comes with that. I think, yeah, I think we're all pretty much Do you find when you meet with your patients that teaching them to pause is one of your biggest challenges? At times, I think, um, I think getting them to really realize the benefit of it, not only in the room, but outside, so on their own. Um, and to really, as with any practice, it takes a while just to build the habit yes. and then to keep it. Yes. But once they do it, I think they really find the, the very clear results of it, and it becomes that much easier to, to hold on to. Do you, you've been here just a few days. Can you see when you walk into a place like this and walk across the bridge at the Golden Door, this instant ability to pause? Do you see that as a brand new person? Do you yeah, know I, I think it's quite unique when you walk across the bridge. Mm -hmm. And I think when you cross the creek mm -hmm. and you take that first deep breath, it sort of like feels like safe and I'm going to be good for a week. You're, bra you're brand new. Yeah, yeah. I um, no, I, I feel like I felt it. I, I love the the way you guys describe the entrance and how you take the idea. So the doors close, you take that first turn, and the outside is there, and now you're here. And ag again, it's it's exercising presence. It's leaving it all out. I, we almost wondered. We've been talking about this a lot lately to sort of share it with our guests that perhaps there's ways too that as you walk out from a crazy busy day back into the home. Perhaps that's a practice as you cross from the car, or cross from mm -hmm. wherever you're getting into your place, to take that pause to say, I'm entering into a safe zone. <laughs> and maybe this is the zone I should not walk in with all the fear and all the digital, all the stuff that I don't want to carry into there. And can we, it, but people don't really think like that because they take it in there. No, but I saying? really like that idea. Don't you? I'm, we've been talking about, this is brand new by the way, like seriously, like as a couple hours ago in my <laughs> research. Well, we're really thinking like if we could do that at the Golden Door on a simple bridge on mm -hmm. a Sunday mm -hmm. in a few seconds, and everybody always says, my shoulders drops, mm -hmm. I feel safe, I'm now in this lobby. Why couldn't we do it at home? It's a mind thing only. Really, yeah. It's not like it only could happen here. It could happen anywhere. Yeah, I love that. And we should. I really, I'm, yeah. I'm all over this. I mean, I... Because uh, I think that goes to where I'm talking about. With digital overload, you sometimes feel overwhelmed with facts. that You can't even connect some of these facts to a meaningful story anymore. They're just a billion facts. Some mm -hmm. of them good, some mm -hmm. of them bad. Mm -hmm. Have we lost the art of the storytelling in our lives? Oh, I hope not. I know, right? <laughs> but I do you not. wonder? And There's so much out there. Well, that we don't pause to have that storytelling dinner, or have that storytelling evening. Admittedly, I am a psychiatrist, so I, I get to hear people's stories. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I come from a different place. I don't hear those stories. <laughs> um, and I and I love that. And that's what that's what drew me to it. I um, I w was an English ma major. I am a reader. I am a story watcher. Um, and so I love having that time with people. 
I think we tell stories different ways. Um, and I think we have to speak to the strengths of technology, the fact that you get to hear so many Absolutely. different stories Absolutely. so quickly and easily that uh, we maybe didn't have access to right. before. And, and it makes us more of a global citi citizenry. Um, so yeah, I hope that I hope that we still have I have our too. stories. I'm, I'm kind of. Do you think technologies that hurt intimacy? Mm. That's a good one, huh? Yeah, because um, it's beeping and it's talking to you, and you can't turn it off. And oh my God, it was a problem you didn't know you had ten minutes ago. And how you <laughs> right. Excuse me, just one second. And it might not even really be a problem, right? But because it has interrupted you, just, you from something else, you have to recalibrate. That's my little bag here. This is the, <laughs> um, do you hear that in your practice? My, you know, I'm just so stressed and overwhelmed and too I much. I hear it about stress, certainly not necessarily completely connected mm -hmm. to the phone. I don't. I. I can't put it, I, I can't make it that singular a, right. a culprit. It's just the stress. But I do think that, getting back to the thing of presence, I really do think that um, in order to be, to, to be truly intimate, whether it's with a romantic partner or a good friend or an associate, you have to be present. You have to be able to be in a space to be able to really sit in with, with each other. Right. Um, we do know that, uh, you know, looking at, at Facebook studies, that, that people who spend a lot of time on Facebook alone do report feeling more depression, whether or not, regardless of what they're looking at, that they, um, they, they actually do feel more isolated and they feel more down, and they end up comparing themselves. And so I think we have to just pay attention. Do, do you think that technology has changed the millennial brain? Isn't that great? I, mm. I do. I, I, I think they're faster. They're so fast. You know, our, our brains are plastic. Our brains are definitely plastic, and that's one of the most fascinating um, discoveries that we've made uh, in neuroscience. And, you know, sometimes I do joke, I feel like we're going to look up, and in 20 years, we're going to all have much larger thumbs. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> or babies will be born with these really <laughs> large thumbs. Um, <laughs> I don't, I, I don't well, know. Well, we have an interesting, in, in, in next month, we have a lot of brain specialists coming in and talking about this. So I love that we're taking January to talk about mindfulness as we approach the creative brain or the innovative brain or the mindful brain. Because there's a lot of research talking about what is going on upstairs today, mm -hmm. how to quiet it, how to speak to it, how to make it healthy, that it actually requires health, how to be mindful. And that mindfulness and meditation every day, if you can possibly do it, is one of the most important things for the brain because it cannot rest. Mm -hmm. It's not like the sun goes down in the old days and you went to bed. And when the sun gets up, you, went, you got back up like the animals do. One of our, our goals tonight was just to share some really interesting insights with Dr. Ford about, you know, pausing. But one of the things we like to do every single time we have a speaker, and we're gonna have some questions and answers afterwards when you like, is you, you must, my dear, leave a golden nugget for our guests. Oh, okay. And we have some incredible golden nuggets that we've gotten throughout <laughs> the year. And so it's one something that our guests can take oh, home wow. with them that they could actually use that you would be giving them. So what would be your golden nugget for tonight mm. for our guests? Well, and we talked about this when we were on the panel together, mm -hmm. and I don't know if, if people have, um, I've spoken about this before, but one of the things that I really encourage people, particularly women, to do is to really spend time on self-care. And this is not necessarily the newest thing to say, but to know that self-care is not selfish. That we have to put on our own oxygen masks first and know that unless we're giving from a place of plenty, we will automatically be depleted. And that's just the basic mathematics. Um, so hopefully that helps. <laughs> <I love> that. <laughs>